Welcome, aloha. My name is Carol Mon Lee, and today's Think Tech Hawaii Life in the Law program's title is Hawaii's Family Court and Epic Ohana, Help for At-Risk Families. And today my guests are two longtime friends, Lori Tuchiki, who is the president and CEO of Epic Ohana. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Lori. And Faye Kimura, whom we know through many ways, and she hap happens to be the mother of one of our floor managers, such <laughs> uh, And uh, Faye's title is, she has two. She's the co-coordinator for the Hawaii Court Improvement Program at the Hawaii Family Court. That's right. And she's a specialist in child welfare at the UH Richardson School of Law, which is where I met you both many, That's many, right. many years ago. Yes, many, <laughs> many years ago. Yeah, you were both Too lawyers. Too many. <laughs> you were really young. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a really <clears throat> important topic for Hawaii, welfare, uh, welfare, children's uh, welfare, and I just want you to tell me first a little bit about what are we talking about welfare and children's welfare. Well, in, in general, we're talking about those children who mm -hmm. have been uh, either abused or neglected, mm -hmm. and the state's role in protecting mm -hmm. children. So it's, it's somewhat broader because it also talks about prevention, but um, in general, for our programs, we're talking about those children where the, the state has taken that role of stepping in and, um, and, and taking affirmative action to protect children who may have been harmed. So give me a sense of proportion. How many children are we talking about? Are they mostly on this island? And what types of uh, geographic or economic or social uh, issues do they have that make them mm -hmm. members of this group? Mm -hmm. um, most of the children that we're talking about are located on, on Oahu because we have the largest population here. Um, but statewide, um, the number of kids in foster care varies from day to day, but it's approximately 1,100 to 1,200 at, at any one point in time. Um, and this is a significant drop from, say, 2004 when the number was over 3,000 children in foster care at any one time in the That's state. That's statewide? That's uh -huh. statewide. And what percentage of the, those are in Oahu? Probably about 80% are on Oahu. Mm -hmm. um, small numbers, I think, I think the next largest mm -hmm. jurisdiction is probably exactly. Hilo, yeah. East nice. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, All right. yeah. second yeah. biggest city. Right. And how do we rate compared to the mainland in terms of percentage of children uh, considered welfare? I'm not really sure about that, but um, um, Hawaii has been really Im important, I think, in terms of uh, in the national scene, just because we've reduced our foster care rates by more than 50% in, in the last few years, and that, that has gotten a, us a lot of recognition. That's a big, yeah. uh, important mm -hmm. difference, then, that your organizations have made in helping to reduce that population. Is that right? There's some significant um, places where we excel as a state. and. Um, there's an annual Annie E. Casey Kids Count that you know talks about the well-being of children in general, not just child welfare. And one of the things that we are really on the top for is making sure that children, whenever possible, are placed with family, and mm -hmm. um, and also just getting children reunified with their families to put the services in place to reunify children. Mm -hmm. So we're we we can be proud. Right. Look, well, I'd like some more background then. So tell me, first of all, how these projects started and then a little more information about each individual, the Epic Ohana and the Family Court Program. Mm -hmm. How did you both get involved in this? I know you're both lawyers and practice and did different things. I've known Lori in a different phase of her life. So how did this, these how do we get involved programs in get welfare? involved? Right. Yeah. How yeah. do we get involved? Yeah. In yeah. Um, I was really lucky to have a, um, an attorney that I worked with for, for my fir during my first year out of, out of law school, who encouraged me to sign up for the court court appointed um, attorney list, yeah. you know, at yeah. family court because I didn't have any experience in in litigation or in practice. And he, he said, "Well, this is a way for you to get to know families, the cl that people that we have to work with, and get paid a little bit of, uh, you know, a little a little amount, but at least get some experience and um, get people to know who you are." 
And about when was this? Because you that was 1981. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. Laurie and I were in, in school together, so right. um, you know we graduated at the same time. But um, because of that, I you know I, I got on the court appointed list and I got involved in uh, in a number of child abuse and neglect cases. And that kind of I, I really. It, the field really interested me because it involved um, not just law but social work and helping people and I've always been a great volunteer for things so it, it kind of uh, struck a chord in, in me that this is some place where I could be of help but not be a traditional attorney. Right. And I know, Lori, you had a mm -hmm. practice in family law, is that I right? I did. And, and I just want to add a little bit of more about Faith. So right in that very beginning, um, like starting like about 84, 85, Faye started getting involved in more systemic things as a pra practitioner. So she's one of the first authors and editors of the manual for court appointed um, attorneys and court and appointed attorneys for in children. child welfare. Yes. Yeah. And, and just helping a lot with systemic issues um, and, until she became the court improvement project. I started off in, in practice in a general practice and then really felt the pull toward family law. Right, and I know and at the law yeah. school you were involved in the family law clinic. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, after practicing, I worked for Judge Wong in family court and helped to develop some programs there, Kids First and a mediation program and other things related to child welfare. And actually in my practice I represented, I also was on the court appointed list. Mm -hmm. So well, Kids I First, that. I know I've heard that about that for years since mm -hmm. we were together at the law school. So tell me a little bit more about that program. It's a great name, mm -hmm. yeah. Kids First. Well, it's actually not in the child welfare arena. It's in divorce. And so I helped Steph Resents and Judge Lance um, bring a, an education program to parents and children who are going through the divorce process. So it, it, and this program continues now. Every um, family that has children um, goes through an educational process. Where you so the parents so are getting divorced and mm -hmm. the children now, you focus a little bit on the children by giving them some support through mm -hmm. Kids First. And the parents too. And, and the pa parents Educating too. the parents. Yeah. So the parents are, are help to understand the developmental stages of children and how children are affected at different stages um, as they grow up. And then the children go upstairs, they get to put on a robe and do a little trial and they do some activities that help them understand that they're not the only children going through divorce and to kind of understand and normalize some of the experiences that they're going through. And you mentioned mediation, what are you doing, mm -hmm. with, what did you do with mediation? Well, in, in the 19, early 1990s, um, this was an effort oh. to um, have an opportunity to not settle everything that's going through child welfare um, cases mm -hmm. in trial and right. to try to divert some of those trials by settlement. So it was an in-court mediation process and that process um, actually continues to this day although there was kind of a hiatus and, right. and it's called it's a different name. Now, now. it has a different name and um, one of the projects for the court improvement project was to rejuvenate that mediation. Mm -hmm. But it was because of that experience that I had that I happened to be at court when the idea of family group decision making emerged with Judge Town. Family and group decision making. Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, the um, Maori people had a, in kind of an indigenous process of deciding when there are problems in the family and gathering the, the whole community to help the family. And so Judge Town and Susan Chandler are very interested in bringing that to Hawaii, and I happened to be at court at the time to help with some of that development. Um, and that is what grew into Ohana Conferencing, which is what our nonprofit organization does. Right, and then somehow that narrowed though into just child welfare? No, it was always just child welfare. Epic yeah. Ohana. Epic is, Ohana. But your welfare. mediation was broader than that though. Mm -hmm. the, now it's really pretty much child welfare. There are other, well, media, there are other mediation programs. Right. But, but the program yeah. that Lori's talking about was the Juvenile Pre-Trial Assistant Program, right? Mm -hmm. the one that's the what we called it yeah. in those days. Yeah. So that was child welfare focused. And then there was a, a, a brief hiatus when um, usage really slowed down. And, there went, and then Judge Broderick was brought in to sort of rejuvenate um, the program. 
Okay, and so, so now, let's, yeah, tell me more about the, the courts program then, now that mm -hmm. I see the beginning of it, Ohana. So now, now the program is called Oahu Child Welfare Mediation Program. Oahu Child Welfare Mediation <laughs> Program. Ochump. Yeah. Ochump. Ochump. Okay. <laughs> so um, that is, we, we have uh, currently three mediators, and um, they, they've been doing a great job because our, uh, our, our settlement rate is about 60 percent. I mean, not full and partial settlement of, mm -hmm. of any disputes, which is terrific. So can you give me examples of some a case, without naming, of course, but what kind of cases would come before? The well, um, any, any issues really um, can be mediated. So we, we have cases, and we started off by mediating uh, mostly cases where um, the, the question was whether the parental rights should be terminated. But over the course of a few years, it's now brought into even starting as early as the adjudication stage. So whether the case should actually come to court or not should be taken over by the court. Okay, so for me and for the public, who m I'd like an example maybe of a case from the beginning. So you have um, mm -hmm. a married couple or a couple with children. And sometimes not. Sometimes they're not couples. Okay, yeah. so you have a child, and how does that get to the point where it will go to you? To what is to the issue? Mediation? Yes. Well, there's a dispute. There's a, um, they, they don't agree with a petition that the Department of Human Services has filed that says that they harmed or neglected their children. Okay. So they could be, they may want to, um, they typically would say, okay, I want a trial on that to, to say that, to prove that I'm not the perpetrator, the person who did these things. Okay, so I'm going to go back a okay. even mm -hmm. further than that. So a child is being raised in a home, and mm -hmm. there's some issue as to the child's welfare because mm -hmm. of neglect or some kind of harm being done, right? Mm -hmm. The state steps in mm -hmm. and takes the child out. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a hotline. Mm -hmm. and so there are different ways that children become uh, part of the child welfare system. Police may be called into an altercation or a situation and find a child who is in need of protection. So the police can be the first line that, that steps in. Or a call comes into a 24-hour-a-day hotline. And there are people who are mandated reco reporters like teachers and doctors, doctors nurses. They um, see evidence of they abuse. Then they are mandated to call in. Mm -hmm. and but often those calls also come from neighbors or, f or family even members, fam even family members. And so then there's an investigation process. So a child is identified as having mm -hmm. an issue that needs, where to, be requires needs to be looked at. Yes. Yeah. And the, step, the state steps in, mm -hmm. and then the parent, is that right? The parent or the guardian would uh -huh. challenge any uh, plan by the state to remove the child? Well, they may mm -hmm. challenge. Is that, that yeah, media? So I'm wondering, could, yeah, is that yeah. where it gets it, to It could be removal, but often it's, it's either, no, we didn't do this, and so we want to prove that we didn't do it, and we want to have, have the petition dropped so that we can mm -hmm. just walk away with our family. And what would the petition do? The petition would be by the state mm -hmm. to intercede mm -hmm. on behalf of the child. When, right. when um, a child is taken away, that's a huge loss of a civil liberty. And so any time a child is removed, it, there must be a petition in court within a very short period, within hours, um, to ask the court to take jurisdiction. And then the court oversees the process so that the rights of the child and the parents are protected. So that's that venue of the, of the court. Sometimes there's a call, social workers are able to speak with the parents, maybe put some services in place. Mm -hmm. There are voluntary programs um, of services and help that can divert completely from court and the children don't have to be removed. But where there's harm, imminent harm, then the, the court has to step in because the, these Protect rights are... The child. Yeah. And right. then there are specific timelines too. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, let me follow up with that in just a second and we're going to take a short break. This is Carol Mon Lee, Life in the Law with my guests Lori Tochiki and Faye Kimura. We'll be right back. 
Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome back. This is Carol Monley with my guest Faye Kimura and Lori Tochiki to talk about child welfare. So we've been talking about how the state gets involved and how your programs service this uh, underserved population of children and youth welfare. So I was wondering whether you had some examples, some stories that you could tell us about uh, where the state has stepped in and what the resolutions were. I think Lori has some really good examples of um, children that have entered the system and the system has really helped them to, um, to get through it and to actually thrive. Well, there are so many efforts. I think that collaboratively between the Department of Human Services and the court, private agencies like you know, Catholic Charities, my agency, um, and the law Epicana. school mm -hmm. have been involved in really innovative ways to engage the family, engage services, and try to try to help. And um, so when in, in and I'm actually struggling to think of a particular family, but let me just kind of give a montage of a family. So there, often um, substance abuse is an issue. I think, I'm not sure what the statistic is, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very About high. 80%. 80% of, of child, welfare child welfare issues cases. relate to stem from or it's, it's related to the, the, the case and the family in some way, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then domestic violence issues. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the, the, the nicest stories, and, and Faye and I are both a part of um, this annual celebration called the National Reunification Month, where we celebrate families and the communities and the whole team that's worked so hard to help a family reunify. And there's a wonderful video and, uh, of a family on Maui, the U'u family, and they were actually featured recently in the newspaper, where dad was in incarcerated, mom was incarcerated. Several children um, in a pretty broad age range were taken into care, since there was no one to take care of them. How many children? I think there are five, five. Five children. And, and was, it was sad because foster, it's very difficult for children to be placed together. And um, so this was in Maui, and the resource caregivers were very, very um, collaborative. And so what they did was, even though the children were in different homes, they each took a turn being the weekend place for all the children. So that means that, you know, on one weekend, all the children would stay in one house, and the other, the other families would have kind of a respite. And then the next weekend, they would go to another house and all be together. Because one of the things we know from our foster youth is that their siblings are so important to them. And when they lose contact with their siblings, it really it just wears at their very foundation. So um, Mr. Mr. U'u was in prison, and a real strong um, partnership with the prison mm -hmm. as he was transitioning out with the social worker, with um, treatment uh, for different issues with family um, parenting assistance to him because he never actually raised the children before. So even just like figuring out how to do schedules and meals and those kinds of things is huge for those five children. And he was able to have those children reunified with him. And so, so your so role, epic was it this Epic Ohana's participation yeah, in this one? We or? were a small part of m many parts. Mm -hmm. Partnership. The, um, of. And, and there are other families where we have more of a role in convening everyone and helping everyone work together. Um, 
in that particular case, not so much. Yeah, but uh, th that case is really a, a, an example of really good social work and good collaboration between the court, the, mm -hmm. the judge, all the stakeholders, and um, and the family. Right. And people really pulled together, and the, and the family was um, really, really, really unusually close. Also, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. during and. It was a anyway, it was a terrific example of how, how how the system can work well for the family, mm -hmm. and come out with with the kids being in, in, in good shape. Right. It doesn't always turn out that way, but mm -hmm. the good the good cases make us aspire to those yes. good practices. And, and Faye, you work with both the UH program, right, and the courts. So what does the UH program do now mm -hmm. the, that it's involved in? Well, some of the things that the um, the project with the law school and the court and the Department of Human Services has, has resulted in uh, includes a, the Oahu Child Welfare Mediation Program. We kind of got it revved up again. We developed curriculums and guidelines and we kind of staff the, the process now. Um, we also developed a, a program called uh, Ho'olokahi, um, primarily with the court, through the court's efforts, um, where we provide an orientation to the, pa the parents on their first court hearing in, a, in their child abuse and neglect case. Okay, so, so how often do you do that and how many parents do you see on a regular basis? The number has, has been going down because the number, number of petitions has been going down since we started the program. But over the course of a year, we might do maybe 300 orientations. Wow. So it's a lot. Yeah. And I, I think it's been very helpful because mm. what it does is, um, our facilitators are from the law school, so we're neutral parties. And so the parents don't identify us as being part of the cause of their anxiety at, at, mm -hmm. at court that day. So we provide a, like an easy an ear to listen to their, their frustrations and their concerns. And we um, are able to give them information in a way that's kind of calm. And we also help them to sometimes read their own court documents because some of them have a hard time reading. And they're also very anxious, so whatever they read doesn't always go in mm -hmm. clearly. So I think we provide a very um, important um, service to the families. And, and do you have follow-up? How, how often do you meet with them? Is there just usually one hearing to determine what's going to happen to their children? No, there's often several hearings, I but we o we're only involved for the first hearing to ensure that they know what's going to happen that day. Uh, make sure that they speak to their attorneys, their court-appointed attorneys, and that um, we're just there to, to be a support to them. So is there any charge for your services? How does a, how are you supported, mm -hmm. funded? Well, we get um, the law school's funded through um, funds from the court, the judiciary, as well as from the Department of Human Services. Because all of the work that we do really helps to improve the system for, for all the the children and families involved in these cases. And that's part of why the court improvement grants were set up, which is to provide a way to ensure the safety, permanency, and well-being of um, children involved in foster care. I see. Can I add a little bit sure. more about the law school programs? Because I'm very proud of them. So it's been about 10 years, and we've had a, the law school's had a contract with the Department of Human Services to provide help with a, a number of different projects and as I look back um, and Faye has been the key mover and shaker of that ever since the beginning but as I look back some of the highlights are real support of a conference called Ohana is Forever which brings together 150 foster youth every year along with their um, the professionals and and just a lot of learning and sharing goes on in that conference. So this is foster as opposed to children welfare? This children who have been removed are placed in care, and that care has been foster called care. foster care. I see. So, so they, foster they're care. They're living with other, either relatives or non relatives, foster parents, resource caregivers. Um, the, the, the program has also helped in the origination of a zero to three court, which is a specialized court for babies, you know, for, because mm -hmm. they, we need to work faster when children who are very tiny are in care. And um, the rewriting of the statute, the 587 statute that was rewritten to 587A. And Faye and two law fellows who are called Betty Vatusik um, and, and Sam King fellows in honor of How the nice. people who, who founded Family Court 
Um, so these are graduates of our law school who really learn how to impact child welfare. The, the um, law schools also had a clinic, a child welfare clinic, that brings together students from social work, education, nursing, and law to learn together how to work together in child welfare. And that's really important because this is not a just a legal problem or just a social work problem or just an mm -hmm. educational problem. It really needs everybody working yeah. together. And how do, do you refer to them cases or how do they get cases? The state refers to them cases? The, the child welfare the clinic? clinic? The child welfare, yeah. yeah. How do they no, get it's, cases? No, it's not, it's not an actual a case uh, a clinic where we actually do actual cases. Case work. Okay. It's more so of a, um, a simulated right. kind of clinic. Yeah, so but they also do projects, so, uh, but not cases. And so then when they graduate, they are able to, if they choose to enter into one mm -hmm. of the different partners and be hands-on, ready to yeah. assist. They're ready to collaborate. But al also, I think it was well, th when the course was started, was being dreamed up. Um, our law school dean, Avi Soifer, um, thought that another key uh, goal of the, of the course was to ensure that the, the students who took the course would have a, um, a base of support and a network that they could rely on when, they are, when they're actually working in the field with families um, so that they could call, you know, a, a lawyer could, can call a social worker that they worked th with on, on a project in the clinic or they can call somebody, a teacher, and, and get some advice on how, to, how best to handle a situation. Okay. And I, over, over 10 years we've probably graduated. Mm. About quite a few, quite a few over, yeah. Se, yeah, over over hundred students. And so, how big is the staff at the family court that work with you on these programs? Well, it's just me, and um, I'm part time, and I have two full time law fellows. Uh huh. And your co coordinator. So you have a, another coordinator for the court improvement grants, yes. which, are, which is um, the work I do with strictly with the family court. I see. Yeah. And who is that? My co coordinator? Yeah. Oh, Gordina Kiona. <laughs> Give her a plug. <laughs> Give her a plug. Yeah, okay. she's great. So, the family court, uh, you have co coordinator at the, co at the UH, the law mm -hmm. school, you're by yourself with some students. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. But, Lori, I know Epic Ohana is much mm -hmm. bigger. Well, it's a statewide um, mm -hmm. nonprofit organization, right. and we provide several services. So, the first category is probably in the family engagement. So we do Ohana conferences where we bring together extended family professionals to try to help the family build that safety net. And especially so that after the department or the court is out of the picture, that those relationships and that safety net can continue for the children. And how are these families identified then? Well, we are referred, so anytime a child is taken into care, an automatic referral comes to our office and from there we start talking with the family, we start talking with the social workers, start talking with other people who are involved in the, in the um, family situation and bring together the conferences. And we have about a thousand of those conferences statewide um, year. every year. Mm -hmm. And so it's at your office or how, where do they yeah. take place? It's really important and again just like the Ho'olokahi program it's really important that people understand that we're neutral and that this is an opportunity for real shared communication. So we try to have the conferences in the community where the family lives. So we have a, a list of almost 300 libraries, churches, schools, um, where we can hold the conferences. And so who would be there from Epic Ohana? Mm -hmm. We have a facilitator and a recorder. So our facilitators are people who are highly trained at helping people have very difficult conversations. And just like Ho'olakahi, it's really important that people understand what the timelines are, what the issues are, what the concerns of the department are, what kinds of services are going to be required, and that that be an open and on honest conversation. So our facilitators are trained to um, pe keep people calm when mm -hmm. they're upset, help, um, everyone co re reconnect and communicate. Okay. Well, I'm going to have you hold that. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue that right after our next break. This is Carol Mon Lee. Today's program, Life in the Law, with my guests Faye Kimura and Lori Tuchiki, talking about child welfare and the safety net for our families. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, 
and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, Business in Hawaii is a program that talks about the positive stories in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing all the negativity. We don't want to hear about all the downside. We want to hear positive stories about Business in Hawaii, and that's what Business in Hawaii is all about. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. Go to Livestream.com for that live broadcast. And we also rebroadcast on Olelo uh, 54 and OC16. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on the show. Take care, and we'll see you next week. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Welcome back. This is Carol Monley with Life in the Law. So we were just talking to Lori about describing Epic Ohana's role mm -hmm. in these uh, children and family issues. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So finish. We're well, waiting. So that's the engagement of families. Yes. And we have other programs that engage families to a program called Wraparound, and Family Connections and Family Finding. But another big part of what we do is really working with young people who are in care or who were in care. And these are foster children. So these are children who were taken away from their families and placed with either relatives or um, professional foster parents. And they're parents. taken away from their families for many reasons though, right? Well, our agency primarily works with young people who are in foster care because of the child welfare system, okay. because they were abused or neglected as children. But there are other children who are fostered, I guess if you think of kind of that broader sense, like children who are orphans or children who have mental health issues and are placed in therapeutic foster homes. So it is a broader, it can be a broader definition. We work with young people who have been in the child welfare system and one of the programs we have is called youth circles so when young people are going to be adults there are so many decisions that any young person has to make about their future what their career what school. their school where they're gonna go social mm -hmm, their health needs all the things that becoming an adult means you, you have to kind of take charge and have that self-advocacy so in a youth circle we gather a youth, one youth's family and supporters, their friends, the professionals who work mm. with them, and together they work through a plan, and it's the youth's plan for their life. And the people in the room, in the circle, help lend support to the youth's plan. And so that plan often includes sharing resources, like how are we going to fill out that FAFSA um, mm -hmm. if they want to go to college, or what colleges, or if there's um, military service or job corps or other kinds of resources. How do you get hooked into those resources? So our youth circle facilitators are very knowledgeable about those resources. And then because of our involvement in youth, in youth circles, we also became the lead agency for the Jim Casey Hawaii Youth Opportunities Initiative. So Jim Casey was the founder of UPS. And he, UPS, oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. and his family, his mom's name was Annie E. Casey, and his family um, was just really had a dedication to foster kids and to, fam well, children mm -hmm. and families in general. Right. And so Jim Casey, the Jim Casey Initiative really looks at the needs of foster youth and former foster youth as they transition to adulthood. And some of the initiatives that we in Hawaii and the Jim Casey Initiative have been a part of are extending care to 21, voluntary care to 21. It used to be that young people, when they turned 18, if they were in foster care, they had no support right after, right mm -hmm. after that. Birthday, and yeah. when you think about our young people, yes, our, yes. we yeah. all have <laughs> children who have now grown up that um, they weren't ready to be on their own or to make decisions about or have the finances. So voluntary care now called Imua Kako was one of the things that we helped, that the Hawaii Youth Opportunities Initiative helped to mm -hmm. lobby. And that's and also support. a specialty court now at Family Court. It's called, yeah. we call it Imua Kako cases. 
Just so, so now young people receive support to 21, including oh, a case see. manager who helps them. And, and, and it's really helpful, the, uh, the peer support and the, the larger support. Also because even in families that are intact, often the young people don't want to listen to right. their parents anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's a really a helpful way. And, and the Hawaii Youth Opportunities Initiative is currently um, helping to uh, support a couple of bills that are in the legislature. So we have youth, let me back up a little bit, we have youth leadership boards on every island. So Epikohana travels to every island then to... Either that or we have staff on every island. We have partnerships with other agencies. So on Kauai we have a partnership with Haleopio. On Maui we have a partnership with the Maui Boys and Girls Club. And so on each island there's a, a leadership board of young people who have been in foster care who are emerging as very powerful and articulate leaders um, in helping to make lives better for their foster brothers and sisters. So this year some of the initiatives are a bill that supports what's called normalcy and prudent parenting. So when you're in foster care you're kind of asked to put your life on hold while your parents go through the services or a court makes decisions and some of those things that for an adolescent um, that are put on hold are very important like sports or staying in the same mm -hmm. school or driving a car, relationships, driving dating, a car, driving yeah. a car, going, having a job. Um, there, some young people tell stories about how they wanted to have an overnight stay with a friend, but were told that they had to have criminal checks done of the <laughs> family, oh, their no. friend's family, and that's kind of a, yeah. a chiller. And one of our, <laughs> one of our young people tells a story about how he was, he had kind of a crush on this girl in one of his classes, <laughs> and he was in a group home where you had to have a list approved by your social worker before you could make the phone call. Oh, no. And all he wanted to do was make a phone call. So normalcy <laughs> means that we as a state, because these are our children, support normal activities and prudent parenting, which means that we're, we're careful parents. Um, but, but it also means that sometimes we have to take some risks, like mm -hmm. allowing a young person in care to learn to drive a car and frankly, that's very risky right. and scary, right. um, I think but part, important. Part of that is, part of the movement is to ensure that kids in foster care that, that are living in a foster family, that they're treated like the, other, like the foster family's own children, so they're not treated differently. I think, right. I think that has, has not been the case sometimes in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I want to add about the Jim Casey Hawaii Youth Opportunities Initiative is that we also have a financial literacy program and about 400 young people currently are active in this program. In the program, we provide um, three-day training about how to handle money, how to budget, how to set up a bank account. And our partners, Bank of Hawaii, help young people open up a bank account. And with our help from private funders, we're able to seed the bank account with a little bit of money. And then when they're ready to purchase an asset, so asset meaning a car or a laptop or tuition or sometimes even a micro loan for a business, small business idea, or the first month's rent on an apartment, then our organization will match the savings of the young person in an IDA account dollar for dollar up to $1,000 a year. So that's a really important mm -hmm. um, place for young people who don't have the means to um, to, to have that support. For instance, many of our young people try college and, and it's difficult. And if you don't have that family support, you might not know that if you drop a class too late, that you're charged for that you're class. Still paying. Mm -hmm. And if you had a loan for that, then you're in default on that loan. Oh no. And then that means that if you want to go back into school, you're not, you don't no. have the ability to be back in school. So some young people are able to use the matching to save a little money, match the money, and take care of that debt so that they can go back to school. So those are life-changing asset purchases. Right. And so of the um, pop total population, you said 12 to 1,500 children now are in the system, and that includes the youth, is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. About how many does Epic Ohana actually um, 
I, are you involved in all 1,200 between the two of your organizations? Well, our youth circles and our Hawaii Youth Opportunities Initiative is for young people 14 to 26. 26. So it actually goes beyond, beyond yeah. even Imoakako, which is 21. Um, <clears throat> and so we do about 300 and 350 youth circles a year. So that's 350 or so young people. And then, in like I said, in the literacy program, it's another mm -hmm. about 400 young people. But no, we're not touching all of those young people. No. Some of them are only in care for a short time. Mm -hmm. um, and then other, other kinds of initiatives, you know, like Zero to Three Court, are really important. So what are some of the major challenges that you're facing as far as whether it's funding or you said some legislation you have you've introduced four bills I believe right and are there well are there we haven't introduced them are actually a part of the um, governor's package, package. Yeah. so some of the other ones are um, the uh, there's some tweaking of the Imuakako laws yeah, and to help just kind of clean up since the law passed in 20 2014 14. No, wait, it became, yeah, 2014. 2014. No, it, it was effective 2014. Yeah. So re relatively recently. Right. So there's some cleaning up things mm -hmm. there. And then there's also some support, and this is much broader than just foster youth, but young people um, are able, if they've been in the foster care system, to have Medicaid until they're 26. Because if they had intact families, mm -hmm. and where are their parents, you can keep your children on your medical insurance to 26. So that allowed them to stay on. However, after 21, dental care is no longer a part of that package. So there are, is some effort to extend dental care um, also to Medicaid, which in turn would help our young people mm -hmm. who are in Medicaid. There are stories of young people in care who, um, and this is true for not just foster youth, the only dental assistance that's available when they have a problem is to pull out a tooth. Oh no! Because like yeah. a, a a root canal is not an option. Right. right. So yeah. yeah. Well, we just a have a thing. couple of more minutes left, and what I wanted to do is ask you both if you had any particular needs that you would like to address to the public, uh, any way that we can help you, the community can help you. What mm -hmm. you would like more? What would you like to tell our well, audience out there? Money is always important. You know we. Um, we like to, at, at the court, we like to provide incentives to the youth to, to be involved in their, um, their own hearings. And so we, we give them things like toys or personal items or we give them a gift card. So far we've been lucky to have a grant from the Geist Foundation and that's been crucial for that to continue. But you know, it may not continue forever and, and we... What, we how big are we talking about? How much money we would give them? Ten a ten dollar gift card. So you know, we're talking about so how many uh, how many children would get ten dollar gift cards? Um, in the course of a year, um, statewide. Um, it's a, almost three hundred, I think. With two sixty. Yeah, two, at two hundred, we run out. Two hundred. We run out of cards. I see. And so the judges have to wait. Uh -huh. For, and the children have right. to wait. So as that's well. where the public could help. They could help. The public can help with that. by donating to the family court. Well, it would, uh, yeah, it would be. The, we have well, friends of family court, friends of the court, that maybe that could be a, a mm -hmm. venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, to receive t uh, gifts that could be in turn given to these children who are in your system. That's right. Thank right. you. Thank you. And Lori, well, I think I would like to ask, in particular, for just support. Then, and I guess this is more almost moral support in the sense that child welfare, you know, often what you hear about in the newspaper are the, the things that have gone wrong. But there are so many people across agencies and the court and the Department of Human Services that are working so hard. And, and we know that when they work together, better things happen. So to the extent that, that everyone un understands that these are our children and we have a vested interest in protecting them and to help support um, just and encourage the people who are working so hard to, to make the lives of the young people better. Right. Yeah, I really agree with Lori because without that kind of um, significant work that the Child Welfare Services does and EPIC does and all the other organizations that help the children and families, that those numbers of, of kids in foster care would never have gone down to the extent that it has. And 
of course, our goal would be to have even fewer That's right. children who are in need. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for bringing to our audience such an important, crucial community issue. And thank you for being such wonderful donors to our system in creating a better Hawaii. So thank you. Thanks thank for you having us. Thank you, yeah, thank you for Laurie having Tuchiki. us. Thank you. And on behalf of Think Tech Hawaii, this is Carol Mon Lee, Life in the Law. Today's our pro program was Hawaii's Family Court and Epic Ohana, Help for At-Risk Families. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.